Asato ma sadgamaya, tamaso ma jyotir gamaya, mrityur ma amritam gamaya, om shanti 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 he. Om, lead us from the unreal to the real, lead us from darkness unto light, lead us from death to immortality. Om, peace, peace, peace. Namaste and good evening, everybody. Respected Swami Balagopalanandaji, other respected members and organizers from the HEB, the HAB, and the Gita Jayanti, International Gita Forum. And dear friends, welcome back again to this series of talks on the Bhagavad Gita. And yes, I remember I had promised a story. Even before Srinivasanji said, our Swamiji here told me, you have to start with the story. <laughs> so I will. I, the stories are as fun, you know, and the people remember stories. They don't remember too much of theory. That's why I think many of the great spiritual teachers, Sri Ramakrishna, um, Jesus also, they are taught in parables, stories. Once uh, somebody asked me, instead of giving a talk on Vedanta philosophy, please give a talk only with stories. So you will see on YouTube that talk has become very popular. Uh, parables, of five stories, I think, five stories. So this story, and we love telling stories and hearing stories. Uh, I remember one of our Acharyas, uh, when we were students in our training in, in Belurmat. So he would tell stories so nicely, he would enjoy it so much. We have heard the same stories many times. We would, we would enjoy it all over again because he's enjoying it. And one good way of avoiding the Vedanta class was to encourage him to tell a story. <laughs> so here goes. There was a question yesterday. What will happen if everybody in the world is enlightened? Suppose everybody realizes, Aham Brahmasmi, this Vedantic enlightenment. What will happen then? So here's a story about that. Very ancient story. And beautiful story. Very instructive. There was once a queen who was enlightened. She knew, she had realized. Aham Brahmasmi, she had realized. After some time, her husband, the king, asked her that, my dear, one thing I've noticed about you, that you are so calm and serene and, uh, and peaceful and joyful in the midst of ups and downs of life, midst of the affairs of state. You are so calm and peaceful. How do you do it? What is your secret? And she said, I was waiting for you to ask. So this is the secret. And then she teaches him that we are actually not this body, not this mind. Same thing which Krishna is telling Arjuna. Same thing. Uh, that we are consciousness. All these problems are at the level of the body, at the level of the mind. You are the witness consciousness, ever trouble free. You are, you are that already. By an inquiry into this, how you will realize it. And taught him meditation techniques and all of that. And uh, he was... I mean, wow! I mean, he didn't say wow, it was not America. <laughs> he said, this is great. I must um, re realize this for myself. So he takes a, a sabbatical, you know, study leave. So he goes off into the forest to meditate. Of course, he's a king, so I'm sure there was a palace in the forest also for him. And she, uh, he tells the queen, please take care of the kingdom while I'm gone. And then he meditates and practices and he becomes enlightened, he realizes, oh, I am this ever-shining existence, consciousness, bliss, not body, not mind, ever free. How great! And he remains immersed in that bliss. After a few weeks or months, he gets a doubt. So he comes back to the capital city and uh, gives his wife, the queen, the good news, that, my dear, what you taught me, I have realized. But I have a question. What is the question? You have realized this long time ago. And there's so much joy and bliss in this. I always want to remain in that. And not mix with the world, mix with people, get engaged in all these affairs of the state. You have realized this long ago. But I see you leading a most ordinary life. Ordinary queen, first lady, but still. So you're doing all the activities in the palace, all the duties, you're going through your daily routine. But you don't seem, you, don't, you never say that I want to go away from it all and remain absorbed in samadhi. 
So what's your secret? And then the queen says, I was waiting for you to ask. <laughs> Good news is, news is that you have realized. Huh? You are the consciousness. You are the kshetragya, the witness consciousness. But now, there is one more thing to be realized. That whatever you see in the external world, which you had left behind in your sadhana, whatever you see in this body, which you had turned your mind away from, whatever you see in the mind, which you had silenced, uh, you are the witness of all of that. All of that is nothing other than this one consciousness. It's not something to be discarded, to step away from, that's something different and I am something different. That's only preliminary. First step. Second step is to see the oneness of all existence. With eyes closed, that same Atman, Brahman, one undisturbed ocean of awareness. With eyes open, it's the same ocean of awareness, it's just in waves now. And he thought about it, meditated upon it, and he realized he was fully enlightened, Jivan Mukta. Now the next stage of the story is, the king and the queen, they taught their ministers and other members of the court, who also became enlightened, and who went out and taught their family members. And they also became enlightened. And slowly this, it spread, enlightenment infection, throughout the city. And over time, all the people of the city, of that little kingdom, they were all enlightened. And the last part of the story is the answer to your question. Well, what will happen? Very interesting, sweet ending of the story. So what happened? What happened to that amazing city? Of course, it was wonderful because there was no more uh, hatred, no more greed, anger, possessiveness, cruelty. All of that went away forever. What did those people do after enlightenment? It says, the story ends like this. They went about their usual business. The day-to-day -day lives uh, and spend their days um, waiting for the prarabdha karma to end, waiting for the final dissolution of their limited bodies so that uh, they would you know, be freed into infinite life. And as they passed each other on the busy streets of the city, they would glance at each other and smile. <laughs> That's all. So it's not that. So what happens after enlightenment? The Upanishad says, after enlightenment, kena syat, how will that enlightened person live? Yena syat, tena syat. That is the answer, is that the way they live, that's the way they live. No rule can be made after being enlightened. Do you start giving, go on a lecture tour, write books and you know, give talks on Gita? You may or you may not. Do you continue with your regular job? You may, but there's no rule that you have to. Or will they still be in the family or will they set out, now I'm enlightened, I'm off, I'm going to put on an um, orange robe and, um, and walk off. An orange robe and this Geru is in India people understand the meaning. Yeah. I'll just add this. So at Harvard, when I went there, they had this huge gender revolution. So first thing they will teach you is preferred pronouns. He series, he, him, his, she series, she, her, hers, they series, they, them, theirs, Z series, Z, them, sir. And they will give you buttons. You can put on the buttons which, which uh, gender you are. To. So they will see that and call you by that gender. Um, and some, some are, there's a blank button. You can put your own gender also. <laughs> I collected all the buttons. So they thought I must be at the cutting edge of the gender revolution. <laughs> Especially with this dress. When I went into the biggest library there, Widener Library, to collect my membership card for the uh, fellowship, the librarian said, Welcome, madam. <laughs> so will you put on a Geru and go out and I am sannyasi now because I am enlightened? The very nice story about, you heard of Nisargadatta Maharaj? I am that, uh, that book. So it is said, when he attained enlightenment, when he realized, Am um, Brahma asked me. How he realized also very interesting. What listening to? Somebody asked him, how did you become enlightened? He simple thing. My guru told me that I am Brahman. Okay? Step one. Step two. I believed him. Step three. And lived accordingly. My guru told me, you are Brahman. I believed him. And I lived accordingly. That's how I became enlightened. Ashtavakra says, 
that Shraddhasvatat uh, Shraddhasva Matra Moham Kurushva Bho All philosophy, Gita, Upanishad, you set it aside You just have this little bit of faith You believe so many things in life You believe advertisers You believe so many things in life Just believe this one thing I am telling you my child That you are Brahman just believe this. Shraddhasvatata Shraddhaswa. Just have Shraddha on this right now, what I'm telling you. Just take it for granted I'm telling the truth. Forget logic, philosophy. If you can do all that, very good. If you cannot do all that, just at this moment, take it on faith. Huh? Do not be deluded on this point. You will be enlightened. It's our real nature. Just certain amount of conviction, stay with it, you will, the, the breakthrough will come. Anyway, so he became enlightened. Then what did he do next? The next feeling, he was living on the, I, I thought he was living in this slum in uh, Mumbai, but somebody corrected me, not in the slum exactly, on the edge of that, and still a horrible area, pretty bad area. And he had a beady business. He said, what a nasty life this is. I have realized who I am. I am off to the Himalayas. And he started walking. Then he stopped. What am I doing? What is there in the Himalayas is also here, in that awful slum. And he came back, same house, same location, for the rest of his life, same bidi business. Brahmagyani. Kena seat, how will he live? Yena seat. So, but that one distinguishing factor will be there, a little smile will be there. Another Brahmagyani will recognize. Others cannot recognize. It is, it is a certain look in the eyes. It's there. Even on internet you'll find some videos. For example, there was one Ananda Mahima. He has passed away. He, uh, she was in the north of India for a long time. I think up to 1970s, 80s she was there. In most of the videos or photographs, if you look at the eyes, it's a sign of somebody who is already centered in the truth. And so simple. Um, there was the founder of the Self-Realization Fellowship, Paramahamsa Yogananda. So there's an interesting thing. He traveled from USA to meet Ananda Mahima, who was much younger at that time. And she would behave like a little girl. So when he came to meet her, she ran to him and saying that, Father, where were you? Baba, where were you so long? Uh, I, I, was, I waited for you. He was a little taken aback. So he said, tell me something about yourself, mother. And she said, there's nothing much to say. Before this, I was, ex I was the same. Then I was born as a little girl, but I was the same. And now I am this young woman now. I am still the same. One day this body will go. I will still be the same. That's all. There's that, nothing more to say. <laughs> So how will the enlightened person live? What will happen if everybody becomes enlightened? That's what will happen. Um, we had one great Swami, Swami Jagadanandaji. He was a disciple of Ma Sharada. And in his own lifetime, many people thought, at least thought of him as being enlightened, Brahma Gyani. Now The story is, he was in our ashram in Dehradun. This ashram, it's a place called Kishanpur, just on the outskirts of, now it's no longer, I hear it's no longer the outskirts, it's well inside Dehradun now. So there, he was there long ago. One day, early in the morning, a young monk, a brahmachari, who was a novice, saw this venerable old Swami, which every, people regarded him as a brahmagyani. He is out collecting flowers from the garden for the daily worship in the temple. So he was a little taken aback. Maharaj, you are also collecting flowers from the, tem from the garden, picking flowers for the worship. See, the idea is, you are such a great Vedantin. He has translated many Vedanta texts and all. You are, many people regard you as enlightened. So the idea is that you must be doing something extraordinary, advanced spiritual stuff. Maybe you will be in Samadhi, maybe giving Vedanta talks, something like that, or writing books or whatever. This picking flowers for the temple is for beginning, beginners like me. So that was all the idea he had in his mind. Look at the answer. Maharaj, even now you are doing this, picking flowers for the worship. So it seems he was very tall and he had a very sweet smile. Somebody who has seen him told me. 
he turned around and looked down at the brahmachari and smiled, that sweet smile, and he said, uh, in uh, original Bengali, but English would be, then you tell me what should I do. In, in Bengali, tahale tumi bolo ami ki kori, which, is, which means, what is it that you think is the natural outcome of Brahma Jnana? It could be anything. So this is what will happen if we are enlightened. Now, yesterday we saw um, that uh, Sri Krishna tells Arjuna the essence of the Advaitic teaching, that you are Brahman. And how do you, do, how do you realize that? The first thing is to see that you are not this body. The body is there. Nobody is denying it. body is there. You are not even the mind. You are not even this person you think you are. Are we supposed to take it on faith? Believe you just because you are saying this wild crazy thing? No. You can see for yourself. And we saw the arguments. Sri Krishna introduces the arguments. Idam shariram kaunteya. Whatever you can say. Idam. This. This. This body, this is an object to whom? To you, the consciousness. Can you say, this mind, this thought? Yes, of course, why not? This thought, this thought is disturbing me. This means it's an object to you, the consciousness. Memories, thoughts, desires, our entire personality, this. Therefore, it's an object to you, the consciousness. Why am I calling you the consciousness? Because you are having experiences. Clearly you must be conscious. You exist, one. Surely you cannot deny that you exist. Two, this existence must be in some sense aware. So it's an aware existence. But totally non-objective. Everything else is an object to it. It is not an object to anything. Everything is known by it or experienced by it. It is not known or experienced by anybody. There is a beautiful hymn. As if to God, to Sri Ramakrishna. And the hymn, we chant it in our temples. Yo veti sarvam nachayasya veta. Who knows all? Whom nobody knows. But who is that? Are we talking about God? We are talking about you. So this is Kshetragya, the knower of the field. Body, mind, all are field. Now at this point, we should experience a great relief. Body will continue, life will continue, mind will be exactly the same. But... I am free of it. I always was free of it. I am not trapped in the prison of body-mind. Take a deep breath. Congratulations, you are free. Body and mind and life, everything will continue as it is. But you are free of it. You are not limited by it. I love this saying. I don't know who said it. Whatever was, it lies behind you in, in your life, whatever is behind you, and whatever is yet in front of you is as nothing compared to what is within you. Whatever is in our past, we are filled with either with pride or remorse or frustration in our past. And whatever is in future, we are filled with anticipation or anxiety or fear or expectation, future. But it is all very tiny, very paltry, very insignificant compared to the glory that is within you. Within you means your real nature. That's what's most important. Once you know what you are, whatever was in the past, you are fine with it. Whatever can happen in the future, you have no problem with it. What a beautiful thing to have. After that, you can live your life. You know, I live like a king. Swami Vivekananda, when he went to the United States, he met a very famous person there. Uh, who was known as the great atheist. The great atheist. Uh, what was his name? Um, I forget. Can you Google him? The great atheist? Ingersoll. Robert Ingersoll. In fact, Yale University recently published a book about him called The Great Atheist. Great Agnostic, sorry. The Great Agnostic. So he met Vivekananda and he said, I don't believe in all this religion, spirituality. I believe only in this life. I believe in squeezing the orange dry, getting every last drop of it. Vivekananda said, I agree with you also. Only I differ in my choice of fruit. I, I like a mango. <laughs> but he said, I 
I know that I cannot die. Therefore, I am not in a hurry. I enjoy every moment of this life. Learn from me how to learn how to live life from this perspective and get 10,000 fold more from, your, from the orange of your life. He says, get every last drop. So this is the beauty of living life like that. Realizing I am this immortal witness consciousness. And Sri Krishna goes further. He says, oh, funny story. I can't resist this. I had, to, I had said this in Santa Barbara in, uh, in California. And somebody there listened to this. And then when I went to the um, where we are dining for, for eating, there was a card that uh, whatever is behind you and whatever is in front of you is as nothing compared to what is within you and what is inside the fridge. <laughs> so we went and opened the fridge, so ice cream was kept there. <laughs> yeah. Sri Krishna goes further and he says that this consciousness, how many are there? There are thousands of people. Are there thousands of consciousnesses or one? And then Sri Krishna says, Idam uh, Kshetragyam Chapi Mam Vidhi Sarva Kshetra Shubharata. In all bodies and minds, there's this consciousness, it's one consciousness, not many. Bodies are many, minds are many, sentient beings, jivas are many, but consciousness is one. And I am that one consciousness. So, two, two things he has said here that consciousness is one, a singular which has no plural, and the second thing is that is the conception of God in Vedanta, that one, one consciousness identified with all bodies and minds. At this point, I did not go through the arguments, but quickly I can run through them. Here there is a huge, huge schism in ancient Indian philosophy. So Sankhya, Yoga, Patanjali Yoga, they all will say many bodies and minds, many consciousnesses. Advaita says one, prove it. Why do you think it's one consciousness? Bodies are many, my minds are many, but this pure consciousness you're talking about, Kshetragya, why is it one? Why not many? Advaita reverses this question and asks the Sankhyan, why do you think it's many? Why do you think it's many? Then Sankhyan says, look, many reasons. It's so obvious. If there are many bodies, there must be many minds and many consciousnesses. For example, if, if is only one consciousness, then the birth of one would be the birth of all. The death of one would be the death of all. The Advaitin answer, that's an easy thing to answer. Because birth and death are of the body, not of consciousness. Oh, um, well, for example, uh, if uh, one person is awake, all will become awake if we are all one consciousness. If one person falls asleep, all will fall asleep. This will be a disastrous thing in a Vedanta class because somebody or the other is sleeping all the time. <laughs> so if one person is sleeping, all will fall asleep because consciousness is one, if you say that. But then the Advaitin replies, we reply, waking, dreaming, sleep, these are all functions of the mind. Now when we go through the Advaitic process of analysis, the same consciousness witnesses the waking mind, the dreaming mind and the deep sleep mind. One mind is asleep, Another mind is awake, another mind is daydreaming. Consciousness can be one. Then the Sankhyan says, no, if uh, consciousness is one, then the, um, you know, if one person becomes uh, illumined, enlightened, all will become enlightened. That would be great, but it doesn't happen. So consciousness is not one. But then again, enlightenment is not in consciousness. Enlightenment, ignorance and enlightenment are in the mind. So knowledge is in the Guru's mind, ignorance is in my mind. Knowledge in the Guru's mind will not illuminate my mind. I have to generate that knowledge in my mind. Then only it will remove ignorance in my mind. The rule is that where there is ignorance, there knowledge must arise. Then only knowledge will cut ignorance. There is knowledge in the Bhagavad Gita. There is ignorance in my mind. This will not remove that uh, ignorance until the knowledge comes here. So it is in the mind. Even ignorance and uh, uh, enlightenment are in the mind. Atman, Brahman does not need enlightenment. So in this way, every argument of the Sankhyan is set aside and the Advaitin establishes there is no reason to think consciousness is different. Typical question will be at this point. 
that if consciousness is the same, in that case, why can't I know the contents of somebody else's mind? If I want consciousness, I know the contents of my mind. I am the witness, the mind is object, this is a field, I am the knower of the field, I know the contents of the field, but why don't I know the contents of all the other fields, if you are one consciousness? Well, this depends on the upadhi, that means consciousness reflected in this mind illumines this mind. Consciousness reflected in that mind illumines that mind. It's like one way of uh, putting it would be, um, the example which I like best is one sun in the sky. Now, all these examples are to be applied partially. And that's the technique of applying an example. Drishtanta will not match the drashtantika completely, only in some respects. So suppose there is one sun up in the sky and in the garden you put multiple pots filled with water. Now you have multiple pots, water in them and there will be a little sun reflected in that water. And assume that little sun which is shining, sun is reflected in the water, the little sun which is shining, that illumines that local water. Now, what that little sun will illumine will, will differ from pot to pot. In one pot there may be dirty muddy water, in another pot there may be Ganga water, in another pot there may be um, distilled water, in another pot there may be milk, another pot may be um, empty or something. So the reflected sun will illumine the contents of that particular pot only, not the others. The sun which is the actual sun, that shines on all equally, but that is not involved with the uh, contents of each pot. You are that actual sun, you are not the, not the pot, what is the pot? Body. You are not even the water in the pot, what is the water? Subtle body, sukshma sharira. You are not even the reflected um, uh, light uh, sun in that uh, water, what is the reflected light? It is the consciousness, the chidabhasa, reflected consciousness which Vedanta speaks about which is exactly the consciousness which we feel now. See, we can go up to that. Body we are aware of. Here is the body. You can do this now. And look inside. Here is the mind. Thoughts, emotions, memories, sense of I, ego. And clearly note that this mind is aware. I am aware. Not only thoughts are there, not only that there are emotions and feelings and perceptions, but awareness is there. That's the reflected awareness. That's the reflected sun. From there to the real sun, which you are, that movement I can't help you with. That one you have to do yourself. Uh, that is the tenth man story. Uh, so at this point, Adi Shankaracharya, and it's non-duality because once you realize that one consciousness is there associated with all bodies and minds, that is Ishwara, and according to Vedanta, Ishwara is the power of Maya, by the power of Maya, Ishwara projects this universe. Tasmadva etasmadatmanaha akasha sambhuta akashad vayo vayor agni agnir apa adhya prithivi taittiri upanishad. From that one consciousness with the power of Maya, the consciousness itself appeared as space. That appeared as um, air and fire and water and, uh, and earth. You will say, what crude old cosmology. All right, forget air, water, fire, earth. You take your modern, um, you know, periodic table. So it appeared as matter. That means that matter, this material universe, is not a separate thing from that one consciousness. So non-duality is established. Advaita is established. One consciousness appearing as entire universe and bodies and minds and reflected in those minds as this reflected consciousness. So behaving as if many jivas. Krishna will say in the Bhagavad Gita later on, avibhaktam cha bhuteshu, vibhaktam iva uh, sthitam. Undivided in all these beings, appearing and behaving as if divided. What is he talking about? He's talking about this, here. This, this, what's going on here. Now Adi Shankaracharya, he has written an extensive commentary, Bhashya, beautiful commentary on this. So those who love Advaita Vedanta will love that commentary. What he does is, he investigates this, this theory, this philosophy, this teaching of Krishna and says, this is great, you feel, I am Brahmasmi, I am that, pure, that one sun in the sky, I am Brahman, I am, um, you know, that's what basically Krishna is saying, Ishwara and Jiva are the same. First he said, O Arjuna, consider this body to be field, Kshetra, 
You are the Kshetragya. You are the consciousness. Okay. And then he says, I am the consciousness. So I and you are one. This idea of Aham Brahmasmi, the identity of Jiva and Ishwara is established. Now, Adi Shankaracharya says, this is a great idea, but wait. Hold on to your horses. Not so fast. We must investigate this. So the way they did it in ancient Indian philosophy, like a dialogue. There is somewhat an opponent, multiple opponents will come. They are called Purva Paksha, the opposing points of view. And they will raise questions. Such questions which will make our head spin. Some questions we will identify with because we have those questions. And there are some questions we can never think of. They will raise these questions. These questions, who are these people? They are different schools of philosophy. And, um, you know, prima facie view or, or some kind of um, common sense argument, all those will be raised. There are materialists, charvakas, there are nayayikas, the logicians, there are the Buddhists and so, more, so many. Those are called Purva Paksha, the opposing points of view. They will be raised attacking what we just talked about. And we must give convincing answers to those. What does this do? Isn't this useless? Some people think this is not necessary for spiritual life. It is actually a great help to spiritual life. In the path of Vedanta, one must get clarity. One must get conviction. Every possible doubt should be raised and cleared to your satisfaction. I can tell honestly, yes, I am partial to Advaita Vedanta, but I can tell honestly, till now, I haven't faced a single question which cannot be or has not been adequately answered by Advaita. Shankara and post-Shankara Advaita till now. It's an incredible system. Incredible system. So, what I'm going to do now, for a few minutes, is to give us a taste of this um, Shankaracharya's Bhashya. Just the initial part of it. It's page after page. Here I've got the Bhashya, just a printout of that. It's densely written arguments, of course, in Sanskrit. I'm going to read out a little bit, translate and see the fun that, that happens. First of all, Shankaracharya starts by a heavy attack on this teaching of Advaita. He starts, it's, this, is, this is absolutely unreasonable. This is illogical. What are you saying? Ishwara and Jiva are one. Four attacks. He'll start with four heavy attacks. What are the attacks? He says, I'll read and translate. Nanu sarvakshetreshu eka eva Ishwara na anya tad vyatirikta bhokta vidyate chet tataha Ishwarasya samsaritvam praptam. If in all these beings, there is one consciousness, and that is Ishwara. Other than Ishwara, there is no other consciousness. Other than God, there is no other consciousness. God has just, just now, Krishna has claimed, I am the one consciousness in all beings. Other than me, then there is no other consciousness. In that case, Ishwara becomes a jiva. Ishwara, God becomes a, an ordinary sentient being, a sinner, a person miserable, subject to birth and death. So, uh, going through the cycle of birth and death, subject to dharma and adharma, subject to ups and downs in life, depressed, unhappy, I will not fight this battle, he is telling Arjuna. <laughs> so, he becomes a jeeva, a jeeva. Ishwarasya samsaritvam pra praptam, Ishwara, God becomes a samsari like us. One problem, second, Ishwara vetirekana was samsarinam, samsarina anyasya abhavat, samsara abhava prasangaha. Or the other way around, if Ishwara alone exists, God alone exists as the consciousness in all bodies, other than that there is no samsari then, no jiva, no ordinary person like us, in that case there is no samsara also. You might say that's good, no? Isn't that what we are arguing for? Yes, that's the ultimate result to go to be free of samsara, but you can't assume that from the beginning. You can't start by assuming no samsara, no problem, gone, go, go home. No use saying that. But this will be the result of claiming that I alone exist in all bodies. That means there is no samsari, no jiva, problem solved, go home. But I can see there are this samsara is there. How, will, how, do you, how are you saying that God alone exists? We exist also. Tatcha ubhaya manishtam. Both are not uh, desired. First of all, God has become like a jiva. What good is such a God? 
or the other way around no jiva is there no samsari is there that does not help us we are trapped you can't start by denying the problem all right funny story i can't resist this in the middle of a serious discussion and i'm saying this because i studied economics it's it, it, it's a dig at economists so one there was a plane crash and some survivors they came on an island and uh, among the survivors there was one architect one engineer one economist now they had only one can of beans nothing else no food how to survive there is no way of opening the can also then the engineer said i will apply my knowledge i will build a fire put the can on top of the fire the air inside will expand and it will burst and we can get the beans and eat it good the architect said it will get scattered let me build an enclosure around it yeah, so that we can collect the beans when it bursts the economist thought i must make a contribution also he thought he said assume a can opener those who have studied economics they know assuming all other conditions remain the same those who have not studied economics will think what what's wrong they will start by assuming something that's completely unreasonable so assume that we have a can opener now open the can but we don't have a can opener that's the problem <laughs> so you're assuming samsara is not there from the beginning ishwara is saying i am the only reality no problem then this is the ubhay manishtam that's not that's not helpful bandha moksha tad hetu shastra anarthakya prasangat how will you explain bondage if god alone exists no bondage is there no samsara then what about um, moksha liberation who needs liberation god is always liberated then what about vedanta what uses vedanta so shastra anarthakyam the vedanta will be meaningless useless purposeless so these are all charges shankara this is not shankara charges view opponents view is uh, attacking his own philosophy and then finally he says pratyakshadi pramana virodhaccha and most of all i am seeing samsara here is kurukshetra here is a fight going to happen i can see it there is no use saying it is all god so pratyakshena tavat sukha dukha tad hetu lakshana samsara upalabhyate directly by perception i can see hear smell taste touch this battlefield of kurukshetra a terrible fight is going to take place whatever your theory is this is what i am seeing with my eyes you can't deny not only that not only by seeing by other pramanas by anuman also he says jagat vaichitra upalabdheshcha dharma dharma nimitta samsara anumiyate i see the diversity in samsara from this diversity some are happy some are unhappy some are rich some are poor someone is a prince a general someone is a foot soldier Uh, someone is a human being someone is an elephant and someone is a horse in this battlefield by this variety i am seeing behind that some causation must be there by that i can infer there is karma law of karma dharma and adharma papa and punya producing this samsara all this i can see by anumana inference so all of this proves to be samsara is there where is your god you are saying god is everything i don't see god anywhere i see god nowhere so that is the objection four fold objection answer shankara acharya gives a laconic reply short laconic reply you know where the word laconic comes from laconia greece so the spartans were great warriors and they were very famous for not speaking much so there is a story when the persians surrounded them said you surrender you have no chance of uh, winning we will darken is sent a message we will darken the sky uh, if you don't surrender we will darken the sky with our arrows if you don't surrender reply came from um the spartans if that was the reply <laughs> if so laconic reply by shankara acharya on this huge attack he says no no i like the american nope nope gyana gyana yo ho anyatve na upapatte because all of this will become reasonable what seems unreasonable to you 
all of it will become reasonable. But if you see the difference between knowledge and ignorance, enlightenment and ignorance, jnana and ajnana are different. What does that mean? Suppose somebody says, in a movie is going on, somebody comes and says, um, hero and villain are the same, sky and earth are the same. Neither hero is there, nor villain is there, nor sky is there, only screen is there. You say, what do you mean? You are mad. There are, there is, you can see the difference clearly. Yes, you can see the difference in the movie, but the whole thing is a movie. When you realize that, you realize, you see the movie, no problem, but you also understand there is a higher level of reality where you see there is a movie screen on that pictures are being shown. In the movie, there is a hero, there is a villain, there is a sky, there is a earth. All these differences are admitted, but not ultimately admitted. Screen perspective, there is no difference, it is one reality. Movie, inside the plot of the movie, differences are admitted. Jnana, Jnana, Yoho. Or dreams. In your dream, suppose tiger is chasing. Now somebody, uh, if somebody comes, wise person comes and says, look, you and the tiger are the same reality. What do you mean? Tiger is chasing me, it will eat me up. No, both are mind only. What theory is this? But when you wake up, will it not be correct? Neither I was there, nor tiger was there. Mind alone appeared in those ways. So when you wake up, when you are enlightened, waking up into the realization of Brahman, you realize the same world will continue appearing, but you know the reality behind it. And like those people in that city, you will have a little smile on your face. Jnana, jnana, yor, anyatve, upapatte. Then he quotes from the Upanishads. Duram ete viparite vishuchi avidyayacha vidyeti jnata from the Katopanishad. Jnana and Ajnana, they are completely contrasting. Ajnana leads to samsara, Jnana leads to moksha. Shreyascha prayascha iti vidya vishaya. He says, he, he quotes from that. Shreyascha prayascha iti vidya vishaya shreya prayastu avidya karyam iti. Shreya, they, they are Vidya, knowledge, enlightenment will lead to auspicious result. What is auspicious result? Beneficial. What is beneficial, auspicious? Moksha. And Avidya, ignorance, will lead to Preya, the apparently pleasant kind of existence, pleasant life. What is pleasant life? I live here nicely, after death I will go to heaven, after that again come back and live here nicely. So, trying to maintain a pleasant life in this world, that is in the realm of appearance. That's the movie. The reality is freedom from the movie. And then Shankaracharya gives to show the difference in the result of knowledge and ignorance. If you have knowledge, you are saved from a great deal of trouble. So, Shankaracharya now quotes from the Mahabharata. I am jumping ahead. Sarpan kushagrani tatho udapanam. Gyatva Manushya Parivajjayanti. Snake is there. Sharp grass. This is a kushagra kusha grass is there. It may cut you. Sharp grass is there. Don't walk on it bare feet. Bare feet. Open well is there. You may fall inside it. Be careful. Uh, when people know that such a thing is there, warning, they carefully avoid it. Agyanata Tatra Patanti Kechit Gyane Phalam Pashya Tatha Vishishtam. So Mahabharata Shanti Parva is quoting from that. By ignorance, not knowing that there is an open well, somebody may fall into it. Not knowing that there is a cobra there, somebody may get bitten. Not knowing that the nice green grass is actually sharp kusha grass, you may get a scratch. Ignorance leads to trouble. So, note, so Mahabharata says, notice the vishishtafala, the special result of knowledge. Knowledge helps you to avoid trouble. And then Shankaracharya goes on. He says, so notice... What is the general structure of Janma, Mrityu, uh, Moksha accepted in Hinduism? So he is talking here to a Nayayika. They are dualists. So what is your belief? Shankaracharya says, you see, he, he tells this. Tathacha, to explain further. Dehadishu Atma Buddhi Avidvan Raga Dveshadi Prayuktaha Dharma Dharma Anushthana Krit Jayate Mriyate Chaiti Abhagamyate what is bandha, bondage, samsara, he says, avidwan, starts with one, does not know who am I. So, ignorance, 
Then what happens? The next thing after ignorance is Dehadishu Atma Buddhi. Who am I? Here, there is a body. I am this body. There is a mind. I am this mind. So I am this body mind. He says, who is this nut, nutcase? You. I. Every time we wake up into this and we are aware of the mind and body, I am this. Without questioning. Without questioning. Why I said nutcase? In an aeroplane recently, they gave these cashew nuts. And the box, the box was called nutcase. So it's a case for nuts, but also nutcase. So, then being identified with the body, what's the harm? He says, Raga Dveshadi Prayuktaha. Then falls prey to likes and dislikes. The moment I am associated with this body, problems start. I am obese, I need to lose weight. I am sick, I need treatment. My mind is so depressed. I am so bored, I need entertainment. Bored, mind, not me, but I am now, I feel I am the mind, so I am bored. Obese, body, it has to be, we can take care of it, but I am obese. How can you, the consciousness, be obese? Body can be, and then you can take care of it, whatever has to be done. But I feel I am this. Doctor will say, you have diabetes, please don't eat sweets. Raga, now I, I, my desire for sweets doubled, increased now. So many funny stories are there about diabetes, I will not tell. I can tell one. <laughs> one Swami is so funny. One Swamiji was there, very sweet, childlike. He has passed away, so I will. Uh, I can tell the story. So doctor told him, Swamiji, don't eat sweets. He liked coconut balls, so do, don't eat sweets. If you feel like eating in India, you get cream cracker biscuit. Uh, eat that. So one day I saw him with a jar of coconut balls. He's eating coconut ball. I said, Swamiji, you are eating coconut ball. Hey, don't worry. After this, I will eat a cream cracker biscuit. So. <laughs> Raga Dveshadi Prayukta, likes and dislikes propel me. Even if I know it is not good, I can't help it anymore. It propelled. Raga Dveshadi Prayukta. When being propelled by my likes and dislikes, I go against my knowledge, I go against my better sense, and I do what? Dharma Dharma Nushthanakrit. If my Raga Dvesha, likes and dislikes, are on the right path, I like doing the right thing, I like telling the truth, I am disciplined by. by my, uh, my personality is disciplined, I like doing good to others, I will go ahead and do what is called dharma, moral life, ethical life. What's wrong with it? It will generate punya, good karma. What's wrong with it? It will generate future births, where you will have to get the results of that punya. And if I am not disciplined, if I am not in control of myself, my likes and dislikes will push me into adharma. Adharma means immoral life. I know it is wrong. I can't help it. Duryodhana's famous uh, reply to Krishna. Krishna said what you... Somebody said, why did Krishna teach this Gita to, Gita to Arjuna? He could have taught it to the villain. Duryodhana transformed the villain. Then no need for a war. Everything would have been fine. Go and teach it to the bad guy. Why teach it to the good guy? Krishna tried. If you see the Mahabharata, Krishna tried. He tried very hard indeed. And when he told Duryodhana, what you are doing is wrong, it is adharma. This is dharma, this is adharma. Duryodhana's reply is very, it touches the heart. He is a villain, but he speaks from something that which we all struggle with, showing that that villain is within us. He says, janami dharmam nachame pravritti, janami adharmam nachame nivritti, kenapi devena hridisthitena yatha niyojito asmi tatha karomi. He says, Look, Krishna, don't teach me what is right and wrong. I know what is right and wrong. I even know what I am doing is wrong. I even know that what is right, I am not doing it. Why not then? I know what is right. That's not my problem. My problem is I don't feel like doing it. I know what is wrong. It's not that I don't know. I know. But my problem is I can't stop myself from doing it. That's my problem. It's no use teaching me what is right and wrong. I already know it. Then why um, uh, are you uh, doing this? He says, there is something within me which is forcing me in this path. What can I do? So very touching. 
and it's a human condition. Now, what is the difference? Slight difference only between Arjuna and Duryodhana. What makes Arjuna Arjuna and Duryodhana Duryodhana? Arjuna says almost the same thing in Bhagavad Gita. He says to Krishna, Ata kena prayuktoyam papam charati purusha anichanapi vashneya baladi vanyojita. What, what is that force within us which makes us do wrong things? Even if I don't want to, I understand what is right and wrong. I sometimes still do the wrong thing. Why? What is forcing me? I want to know. I want to change. Please help me. This makes the difference between Arjuna and Duryodhana. Duryodhana never for once asked Krishna for advice. I am like this, I am fine. I don't care to know your Gita and all that. Arjuna said, I am not fine. I am in trouble. Please help me. That please help me, I am willing to change. Then only all philosophy, Vedanta, positive psychology, all the therapists know. The first thing is, the client must be willing to come to the therapist. Otherwise, the therapist cannot help. I will tell you a very, very rural, rural, Indian rural example. One sadhu in Uttarakhand told me. He said, I will tell you in Hindi and translate. Very dehati, you know, rural kind of Hindi. He said, Amare gaon mein sab log jante hain. In our village, everybody knows. Farmers, calf, newborn calf. Kaun bachega, kaun nahi bachega. Which one will survive, which one will not survive. There is one type, he says, which is struggling to stand up, cannot stand by itself. The farmer goes and helps that calf to stand up. It will survive. The another one, if you try to make it stand up also, it collapses. It has given up the battle to live. It cannot survive. He says, you make that struggle, God will help you. Unless you struggle a little bit, no help will come. Swami Turiyanandaji, so Sri Ramakrishna's thing was there, there was this bird. Uh, by your own effort you cannot realize God. By grace of God only you can realize God. So there's this bird which uh, uh, used to, was flying and sat on a the mast of a ship. Then the ship sailed into the ocean. And the bird was desperate. Oh, where is the land? It flew to the east, no land, came back. Flew to the west, no land, came back to the mast of the ship. North, south, nowhere it could find land, came back to the master of the ship. And then out of tiredness, it resigned itself to the ship. The ship itself carried it to land. Similarly, he says, you tire your wings out, all your sadhana is for tiring. We will talk about spiritual practice. All your sadhana, remember, it's for tiring your wings out, not for getting God. You can't purchase God by your sadhana. So your sadhana is for tiring your wings out. You sit on the mast of the ship, which is surrendered to God. Hold on. It will take you there. However, an effort is required. Swami Turiyanandaji, another a disciple of Sri Ramakrishna, was in Banaras in those days, a very revered monk in those days. A young monk, having heard this story, he says, oh, this is the secret of sadhana. And he went and told Swami Turiyananda, I have understood. I will not fly anymore. I will sit. Turiyanandaji said, when did you fly? <laughs> when did, in Bengali, when did you fly? So the little effort must be made. Otherwise, um, the, the, the grace also does not come. So Shankaracharya says, this is bondage. Dharma dhanma krit, due to... Uh, my dharma and another adharma, newer and newer lives. Karma is generated. Jayate, mriyate, cha is born and dies and then born again and dies again and so on and so forth. Then what is liberation? The standard model of liberation in Nyaya, many Hindu philosophies. Dehadi vetirikta atma darshinaha, raga dveshadi prahana peksha, dharma dharma pravritti upashamat, muchyante. Iti na kenachit pratyakhyatum shakyam nyayataha. He says, the one who sees I am not body, not mind. Body mind is kshetra, field. I am the kshetra, consciousness, witness of the field. That one, what happens then? Raga dveshadi prahana peksha. Is able to transcend, is able to eradicate, is able to rise above this pulse of likes and dislikes, which Duryodhana had a problem with. 
If I am not the body, not the mind, then the urges in the body and mind are not my urges. It gives you a little gap, a psychological gap to deal with it. As long as it is mine, I can't deal with it. One Swami, I will not take his name, very advanced spiritual practitioner. He once, in talk, he said how he overcame, you know, anger, lust, greed, yes, telling us, telling me and, and one more Swami. The way he told it, I immediately caught on. I said, Maharaj, tell me the truth. You have known yourself as the Atman, not body, not mind. I pressed him on it. He agreed. He, he, he said, yes, I have seen that I am the Atman, not body, not mind. Lust, greed, anger are in the mind. And they are objects. Now you can deal with them. If I am mixed up with it, what will happen is, if I am the mind, and in the mind there is lust, there is greed, there is anger, then what, what happens? I feel the greed, it is mine. This anger is mine. I am angry, it becomes. Then it's very difficult to... I am angry and I don't want to be angry. You get pulled like this. But anger is there. Kshetra, object, like an object there. I can deal with it. Still effort is required, but I can deal with it. I am free of it. From that position, I can deal with the problems in the mind. So he says, Raga Dveshadi Prahana Peksha gives up Raga and Dvesha, clears it up. Then Dharma, Dharma, Pravritti, Upashama. This pursuing Dharma and Adharma, this ceases. New karma is not generated. And old karma is exhausted. And he attains Muchyate, Muchyante. They are, such people are freed. Whose theory? Not Shankara's theory. This is the traditional dualistic theory of bondage and liberation. That's why he says, Na kena chit pratyakya tum shakyam. Nobody can deny this. You all accept it. Those his, his opponents is talking to. Only materialists will not accept this. But the dualists all accept this. Then he goes on, Tatra evam sati kshetragnyasya ishwarasya eva sataha avidyakrita upadi bhedata samsaritvam eva bhavati yatha dehadyatmatvam atmanaha. Then he makes an interesting point. He says, you dualists, the Nyaya school for example, what they think is, actually I am not the body. Body is born, body will die, I am the Jivatma. I will go on to other bodies and minds. But I, I am identified with the mind, it is my, uh, it is, I am connected to it. So depression, anger, desire, those are indistinguishably connected to me. But body is not connected to me. Body will die one day. I will go on. But the other problems in the mind will go with me. So he says that just as you think body, old age, death, death by mistake, these are identified with the self. Who thinks this? The dualists also will admit that old age and death are attributes of the body. By mistake, we think, I am old, I am going to die. Body is old, body is going to die. Just like this mistake you make, similarly is the mistake that um, we make about the mind. Pleasure, pain, desire, frustration, anger, greed, lust, those are also qualities of the mind. They are equally kshetra, object. They are also not mine at this moment. This is something that the dualists don't accept. And Nayaika, he says that is pay, pleasure, pain, desire, they are all directly connected to the Atma, they say. And then he goes on to explain. Sarva jantu nam hi prasiddha deya deha dishu anatmasu atma bhava nishchita avidya kritaha yatha sthano purusha nishchaya nacha etavata purusha dharma sthano bhavati sthano dharma va purushasya Tatha na chaitanya dharmo dehasya deha dharmo va chaitanasya sukha dukha mohatma katwadi atmana na yukta avidya krita krita avidya krita twa avishesha jaram rityuvat. Very nice. <laughs> he turns, it's like a philosophical jujitsu. He says, just as you all, sir, you agree that actually old age and death do not belong to the self, they belong to the body. Because you are people, these dualists, you all agree that we have many lifetimes. If you have many lifetimes, body is perishes. 
then we are going on to new bodies then what happened to the body and the properties of the body belong to the body and not to you what are the properties of the body at one time body will become old it will become diseased it will die old age disease body uh, death belong to the body by ignorance only people say I am afflicted by old age, disease, death. This you agree, we agree. Exactly like that, the, the characteristics of the mind, shoka, misery, delusion, moha, anger, greed, lust, these characteristics of the mind, they are not yours. Just like that, out of ignorance, we think it is I, anger, lust, greed are my problems. They are in the mind and we can clean up the mind. Like that. And then he gives an example, classic example, a pillar. Somebody looking at a pillar in a distance thinks that may be a man. You can think of a dried tree stump. With, you can imagine two dry branches like this. From a distance looks like a man. So that is a man, somebody thinks, Purusha. But that does not mean actually the qualities of a human being will be in that um, uh, tree stump. It will not become a conscious living human being. Nor will the qualities of the tree stump come to the man. This is an um, uh, identification in error. Similarly, you are identifying um, your self-consciousness with the mind. This is an error. Qualities of the mind do not come to consciousness, your consciousness. Your quality, that is awareness, conscious, consciousness, does not go to the mind. Mind is not conscious, not the self. It's not you, not aware. You are you, the self, you are aware. And mind has the, has the characteristics of anger, desire, uh, delusion. You don't have them. This distinction he makes. And he uses the argument of the dualist. Just as you, sir, said that, Though we feel we are getting old, we feel we are uh, diseased, we feel we are going to die, but those belong to the body and in your philosophy itself you admit you are not the body. Body dies, but you don't die. Similarly. Then the argument will go on. I am not pursuing this further. Long and very interesting. If you go on, um, at one time you will feel that Advaita is collapsing, the way he attacks Advaita himself. And then when he re-establishes it, your clarity will be more. What is the use of this kind of debate? And this, they say it's like putting a pillar in the, in the soil. When somebody drives a, a post, a wooden post into the soil, what they do is they drive it in and then they loosen it further and then drive it in even deeper. So this loosening it is, you will make a philosophical position, attack it and then answer all the attacks, then your position is even firmer. Take up every possible question, debate it until you get clarity. You will say this is all intellectual. Yes, intellectual, why not? Let it be intellectual. So the clarity is, uh, is uh, attained. Now, sadhana, spiritual practices, quite apart from all of this, why is it necessary? So I'll make a few observations and details we'll go into tomorrow. Then we'll go into question and answer today. If I am Brahman, if I am consciousness, free of old age, disease, death, body has got it, free of uh, anger, greed, uh, desire, hatred, that is at the level of the mind, I am always free of it, then why do I need spiritual practice? I am free as it is. What practice do I need? But when I say this, most of us are not satisfied. We will say, we will scratch our heads, yes, all that is all very nice, but I don't feel it yet. My suffering in the world continues. You say, I am Brahman. I read it, I hear it, I sort of vaguely get it also. But it's not a, a, a solid living reality. So in, um, in Vedanta they say, Paroksha Jnana, in Hindi they will say, Paroksha Jnana, Aparoksha, uh, Aparoksha Anubhav ko kaat nahi sakta hai. Indirect knowledge cannot cut your direct experience. My direct experience seems to say, I'm very careful here, seems to say, I am the body, I am the mind. And uh, some kind of knowledge has come into my mind that I am not body-mind. That will, is not enough to cut, cut my direct experience. Direct experience can be cut only by direct experience. Now, how to make that knowledge direct experience or to see that it is actually already a direct experience, that is the need for sadhana. 
I am Brahman, I am being told I am Brahman. Now my problem is, I don't know that, I mean I don't realize it, I don't feel that. So this I don't know that, I don't realize it, I don't feel that, this is called Ajnana, ignorance. What is the problem? Ignorance. One might ask, I am Brahman, how can I be ignorant? And the sun, how can there be a shadow in the sun, darkness in the sun? So if you read Vedanta, after, after some time this question will be bound to come. Whose is ignorance? Because body and mind are field, objects. They don't have ignorance. I, the consciousness, Brahman, I cannot have ignorance. Whose is ignorance? Shankaracharya answers it humorously. In this, in this commentary itself it will come. Somebody will ask, wait a minute, I understand, I'm beginning to understand this. Then you are saying, I am ignorant, I need knowledge. But who, who, is, who has got ignorance? I am Brahman after all. Then Shankaracharya says, then why are, uh, then, um, why are you asking? He says, I am asking because I don't know. Ah, you don't know, that is ignorance. <laughs> as long as I honestly state that I read all these things, I listen to it, I agree with it also, I like this idea, but it's not a living reality for me. Then I have got ignorance. Problem, ignorance. Solution, knowledge. For any ignorance, problem is, uh, solution is knowledge. Now this knowledge, the two principles of knowledge removing, removing ignorance, two principles. Vishaya and Ashraya must be same. It's a fancy way of saying what you are ignorant about. For that you must get knowledge. If I am ignorant about Sanskrit my, and I go and attend a class in English, it will not remove my ignorance of Sanskrit. If I am ignorant about myself, then the knowledge also must be about myself. Second, Ashraya. Where the ignorance is, there the knowledge must come. I have ignorance here. My professor has knowledge. It will not help me. The knowledge must come in my mind. So, ignorance and knowledge must have the same locus and object. This is a philosophical way of saying something very common sense. So, I need knowledge. What will be the method? Solution knowledge. What will be the method? Jnana Yoga. Shavana Manana Nididhyasana. Come to the texts, study it, listen to it from a teacher and then think well about it and meditate upon it. You will get the knowledge, that knowledge will remove ignorance and problem solved. Say, well, Swamiji, I, you are not the first speaker on Vedanta. We have been hearing this and some of us are here so senior, we have been hearing this before you were born also. So, Shravana Manana Nididhyasana is going on, no knowledge, nothing, nothing is coming. Then, what is the problem? In one place, in the, when Sri Ramakrishna is teaching, at that time he is keeping quiet, some people are discussing Vedanta, that you are Brahman. Sri Ramakrishna listens attentively, then he just makes one comment. In Bengali he says, Katha gulo to bhalo, dharana hava chai. These words are very good, but you must assimilate them. What you are discussing here is really good, but you must assimilate it. You must see what, it must become a living fact. Just like food is assimilated, otherwise poor digestion, indigestion. Food is assimilated. Similarly, this knowledge must be assimilated. So assimilation is not happening. Why not? Second tier of problem. Second tier of problem is vikshepa. First tier, remember, agyana, ignorance. Second tier, vikshepa, flickering mind. First tier, a problem, ignorant mind. Second tier of the problem, second level of the problem, flickering mind. Flickering mind, vikshepa, solution, concentrated mind. Mind is not concentrated, the solution is concentration of mind. The Americans call it no-brainer, it's concentration of mind. How will I do that? Method, problem, solution. Method? Method is upasana, meditation, dhyana, focus, big, big topic, especially in this day and age. In some places, I had to give a talk in India. Students, when you were not very interested, Atma, Brahma, you forget it. Please tell us about concentration, focus of mind. Big area, in positive psychology, lot of research is happening now. In Vedanta also, focus is very much necessary. Our we have limited attention. That attention, cognitive bandwidth must be collected and focused on the subject we are talking about. So that I can... 
I really, really can listen. If the mind can be focused, stilled intensely on this teaching, even for a moment, you can make the breakthrough. We are not doing it. So meditation is useful. For what? For developing the focus which will enable us to make the breakthrough. For that whole host of techniques, best technique, Patanjali Yoga, oldest manual of meditation. And then so many techniques of meditation are there, all for developing focus, which will help us to assimilate this truth. Then somebody will say, meditation also I have been practicing Swamiji. I have taken Mantra Diksha long before you were born. <laughs> then what is the problem? I try restless mind fall asleep. Not only our problem, when medita meditation is taught by Krishna to Arjuna, in 6th chapter of Bhagavad Gita, Arjuna has the same question. He's, and he is quite forthright. He says, O oh Krishna, what this, this meditation, the yoga of meditation you have taught me, I must say it's perfectly useless. <laughs> Why is it useless? He says, because my mind is restless. You are telling me to focus in this way, mind is restless, it cannot be focused. It's like Vayuriva Sudushkaram, it's like trying to control the wind, control the air in this room. How will you control it? Krishna says, Krishna agrees, it's very difficult. But he says, Abhyasainatu Kaunte, Vairagyena Chakrihate, and he gives two strong practices, dispassion and systematic practice. There is a huge amount of psychology involved right now. Some of the latest findings in positive psychology, they back this up totally. I mean, I have no time to go into that. But the second tier of uh, problem, distracted mind, flickering mind, solution, concentrated mind, focus, method, meditation. Raja Yoga, Dhyana Yoga, or many types of meditation are there. Vedanta is interested only that it develops focus, that much Vedanta wants. In uh, traditional terms, upasana. Upasana. In traditional uh, Vedantic teaching, there will always be a component of upasana. It prepares the mind for Vedantic teaching. We try to jump direct, directly to Aham Brahmasmi. Guru will tell me Tattvamasi, I will realize Aham Brahmasmi, finished. Not so fast. Now I do that, focus is not happening, flickering mind. Third tier of problem. I promise this is the last tier. How long is this going to go on? <laughs> Third tier of the problem is that uh, impure mind, chitta mala, impure mind. Lot of garbage has been stuffed into the mind. The mind is conditioned, unfortunately. Mind is not quiet, not peaceful, does not find interest in spirituality because we have tortured the mind. We have perverted the mind. Mind in its very nature, some, some uh, one sadhu put it, this kshetra, the body mind, is meant for sadhana, for God realization. But we see that it is obstructing us. My body is troublesome, my mind is troublesome, I want to realize God. But you have damaged the body mind. You have twisted it in such a way that it is now flowing towards the world. So this garbage we have dumped into the mind. If you go into this dumpster, here you don't have dumpster, it's a very clean city. New York is not so clean. So the dumpster is there. There are sometimes homeless people, they will eat from the dumpster. Now, we will never do that because we know it immediately stomach will be upset, we'll get sick. But we do that as we treat the mind like a dumpster. Whatever is coming to us on all kinds of sources, we dump it into the mind. No, man, no wonder the mind is sick. So chitta, Mala, impurity of the mind. Solution, purity of the mind, no brainer. Chitta Shuddhi. And powerful method of purification of mind is Karma Yoga. It's selfless work. Because the greatest source of impurity is selfishness. I will do everything for this body mind. This is the greatest identification with Kshetra. This is what ties the Kshetra Gya with the Kshetra. This selfishness. This I am, this body mind or those who are related to this body mind. My son, daughter, my own relatives, that much only. I, me, mine. You expand beyond that. Selfless work. That's why volunteer work, selfless work, uh, karma yoga, very great purifier. Now you have the structure of sadhana. Uh, what is the structure of sadhana? 
by karma yoga purify the mind it will remove the impurities with the purified mind meditation will immediately lead to concentration the flickering mind problem will cease pure mind is gets focused very fast with the pure and focused mind this vedantic teachings will click just like that and knowledge will arise oh this is it aham brahmasmi and remove the ignorance that i am body mind free which you always were not that you become brahman then you realize what was always existing vedanta always says praptasya prapti nivrittasya nivritti somebody says management consult and what do they do they will look at your watch and tell you the time from your watch <laughs> vedanta is like that vedanta what will it give you what you already have it will give you you are brahman already it will show you that you are brahman what will it remove from what problem will it solve that problem which was never there at all what was the problem samsara never there nivrittasya nivritti praptasya prapti vedanta does that this magic trick so remember this triangle this kind of not triangle this matrix 3 by 3 matrix if you keep it in your mind problem solution method problem is um, uh, impurity of mind solution is purity of mind method is karma yoga problem is uh, di- distracted mind method is uh, the solution is concentrated mind method is meditation whatever tradition you have problem is ignorance solution is knowledge method is gyana yoga you said you have not mentioned bhakti swami ji bhakti is something that is useful at all three levels at all three levels it purifies the mind it concentrates the mind and by grace of god you can get that knowledge also at all three levels by ishwara kripa kripa all of this will work ramanuj acharya makes a, makes a good point here he says this you advaitins when you talk about stilling the mind realizing i am brahman control of the senses so your enlightenment depends upon your control of the senses without that no karma yoga is possible without that no meditation is possible and ultimately no gyan is also possible so your enlightenment depends upon control of the senses but you are saying control of the senses requires you to see i am the atma like that swami said i realized i am the atma that therefore i was able to overcome lust greed anger now Sri Ramanuja points out this is a vicious circle you have set up upon enli- enlightenment depends upon your controlling the mind and controlling the mind depends upon enlightenment in this way he says at no point will you reach enlightenment then what to do when he says controlling the mind is first bhakti makes it much easier bhakti makes it much easier because the mind flows to what it loves to so set up god as the object of your love introduce bhakti into your practice your practice will be much faster so this is the scheme of sadhana what shri krishna says about it detailed instructions he will give tomorrow we will go into that practicalities one sadhu said aap bahut badi badi baatein karte hain mahatma ji you talk about too many big things kabhi choti cheezon par bhi dhyan dijiye sometimes pay attention to the details so the details we will see we'll see tomorrow